So Willem Mika Gawinoven. Perfect. Yeah, and so um, I'll go ahead and introduce her. Um, she did her PhD in the lab of Professor Martin Smith at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, where she investigated the molecular programming of embryonic dopamine neurons. She then started her postdoctoral career in the laboratory of Professor Louis Trudeau in the University of Montreal to deepen our understanding of the physiology of dopamine neurons and of in vivo mouse models of Parkinson's disease. In November of this year, she joined uh, the brand new lab of Dr. Janelle Druin Ulet at the University of Montreal also. He used human stem cell biology uh, and direct fibroblast reprogramming to develop better in vivo models of neurodegeneration of neurodegenerative disorders and of Parkinson's disease. And so with that, um, I'd like to quickly remind people of the chat where you can uh, ask questions. Please click on the little um, text icons that says stream three and send your questions there because that will send them only to us in stream three. If you click on the one that says everyone, that will send the chat to everybody. And if um, you uh, want to see the PowerPoint bigger, you can click the little uh, arrow up next to the rooms and chat bar that will close the sidebar so the PowerPoint will be bigger on your screen. All right, with that, um, I'd like to present Zilamika Kunenova. All right, so I'll start sharing my screen. There we go. And let's get the presentation started. Yes. All right. Yes. And before I start, um, I want to take uh, uh, want to uh, thank the organizers uh, for this great event, uh, for this great initiative. Um, besides uh, being a postdoc at the University of Montreal, I'm also the postdoc representative at the Union. And in that capacity, I uh, have learned a lot about all the challenges that postdocs face. So uh, today, it's really uh, refreshing to see such a, a nice initiative to support uh, postdocs. So uh, thanks again, and I'm very grateful to be able to participate uh, today as well. And with that, I would like to start to talk about um, the, uh, the dopamine neurons that express VGLU2 and how they might contribute uh, to uh, the innervation of the striatum in the, the post-lesional brain. I did this work in the lab of Louis-Éric Trudeau, indeed, at the University of Montreal. And I thought I, I'll give you first a small uh, overview of what my presentation looks like today, uh, because I will first start, obviously, with giving you an introduction of what was known already about the um, VGLU2 expression uh, in dopamine neurons uh, at the start of my postdoc uh, project. Uh, then I will explain to you um, uh, the, uh, the paper that we recently published uh, in January Science last month, uh, so the data that was taken from that. And I've decided to, uh, throughout the presentation, also refer uh, quite a few times to uh, three different papers that were uh, published in the last two years. And these papers from uh, the NASCA group, uh, which is Stein Kellner et al., um, the Bunchy group, which is Shen et al., and uh, from uh, the Wallen McKenzie group, um, were published on topics or, uh, using experiments that were very similar to what we did or sometimes uh, wonderfully uh, uh, complementary. So um, by including their data, I'm hoping to give a nuanced, a well-rounded uh, overview of what the field um, knows about the VGLU2 expression uh, as of today. Well, I'm going to keep the introduction of the dopamine system very brief here at the virtual dopamine meeting, uh, but we've been focused on the substantia nigra, uh, these dopamine neurons that are located in the mesencephalon and that project mostly to the uh, dorsal part of the striatum. Um, in addition, and close by is, uh, are the, the, the VTA neurons located, or A10 dopamine neurons, that innovate more the ventral part of the striatum. One reason to be interested in uh, dopamine neurons is their involvement in Parkinson's disease, which is especially the case for uh, the SN neurons as they uh, display a selective vulnerability. They are specifically uh, vulnerable in that pathology. And one way to, to mimic certain aspects of that disease is to use neurotoxic lesions, which um, specifically target the dopamine neurons. So the use of 6-HDA, MPP+, and MPTP um, can be used to, well, as I said, 
mimic certain aspects of that disease. And we'll be looking at some data sets using these tools uh, a little bit later on. And finally, um, these dopamine neurons of, the A, of A9 and A10, they share a large common molecular profile. Uh, an important gene uh, within that profile is tyrosine hydroxylase, or TH, uh, which is the rate limit in step in the production of dopamine. And for this reason, it's a very good gene to use as a way to, to visualize or mark the dopamine neurons. And we've been doing this as well. And another marker we've been using, uh, which is very commonly expressed, is the dopamine transporter. Uh, well, VGLU2, the vesicular glutamic transporter, um, any dopamine neuron that expresses this protein uh, has the capacity to package and release glutamate in addition to dopamine. And uh, currently, the fact that a subset of dopamine neurons have that capacity is quite well accepted. Uh, but when uh, my postdoc professor, Louis-Éric Trudeau, started his lab in the late 90s, this was not at all the case. And it was really... Uh, his work, but also the work of uh, David Saltzer at that time, that showed for the first time that uh, dopamine neurons can uh, create glutamatergic synapses uh, within a culture. Then uh, the Trudeau lab went on to also show that uh, dopamine neurons can uh, express VGLU2 transcript and protein, and I'll just start my laser pointer, because in this image you can see the expression of VGLU2 uh, protein and TH uh, in the same cell, and this is actually a cell that makes a synapse upon itself. The Trudeau lab also showed that uh, this expression of VGLU2, this phenotype, is repressed after birth and throughout the, the neonatal and postnatal maturation. We see that the dopamine neurons express less and less of this uh, transcript. Another lab that did a lot of work on this topic is the lab of Professor Morales. I think she's at the NIH. And uh, this group uh, did many studies showing uh, the localization of dopamine neurons that have this phenotype. So they used in situ hybridization combined with uh, immunohistochemistry uh, to show here, this is an example of one of their papers, that the VGLU2 positive dopamine neurons are located very in the medial part of the VTA. And by now, they have shown that these types of dopamine neurons can be found in mouse, in rats, in primates, and uh, recently also in humans. Another experiment that this lab uh, performed, which I think is very important, is the quantification of the level of VGLU2 expression within these dopamine neurons. Uh, they used uh, microdissection to take out uh, an adult dopamine neuron and quantified that within that, uh, only 10 copies of VGLU2 uh, are expressed, which is a very low number, and it's about 10 times less than uh, TH. So these dopamine neurons clearly have still a uh, first a, a dopaminergic uh, phenotype and secondly a glutamatergic phenotype. And I think that the fact that VGLU2 is expressed this low uh, in dopamine neurons contributes to the uh, to the fact that uh, it took the community this long to to accept that VGLU2 can be present in these cells. But currently, this is clearly very well accepted. And this is a paper that I just wanted to refer to. It's uh, recently published by Jean-François Poulain, who um, summarized uh, five different uh, RNA-seq data sets, or papers, different studies, all focused on trying to understand um, the different uh, subsets that can be present within the uh, uh, dopaminergic midbrain population. So the very brief distinction that I made at the beginning between SN and VTA really is not sufficient anymore. And based on this paper, uh, we can recognize, or and then therefore based on these five different uh, studies, we could recognize at least seven different subsets um, uh, in the adult uh, dopaminergic uh, system. And here we are focused, as I mentioned here, in yellow on the, the dopamine neurons in the SN that express VGLU2, so which are here located at the tip of the substantia nigra, and in dark blue, the dopamine neurons that are located here in the medial part of the VTA, which we already saw uh, in, the, in the work of Professor Morales. So now that we know that there is definitely a, a, this, well, a minority, but a subset that expresses this protein, we want to know what is it doing? And this is definitely a question that has been asked before in the, uh, the literature. And 
uh, within that, we, we recognize two main topics that have been coming back, two main functions uh, in which Figure 2 seems to be involved, and which, which is the exonal outgrowth of dopamine neurons and also uh, promoting uh, survival or resilience of dopamine neurons. So um, a group that worked mainly on that first topic uh, is the group of David Salzer in New York, um, and they investigated whether it's possible that the dopamine neuron that releases the glutamate could also be the, recep uh, the, the recipient of the glutamate. Uh, so they showed in um, primary dopamine neurons that um, they can express glutamatergic receptors such as here, uh, NMDA uh, R receptor, the NR1 subunit, which is very nicely present in the growth code of dopamine neurons. And when they stimulate this receptor with an agonist, they saw that the uh, outgrowth of the axon accelerated and that these axon, uh, axons uh, became more branched. So they proposed that VGLU2 and glutamate release contribute to the axonal outgrowth of dopaminergic neurons in a way that is considered more of an autocrine glutamatergic feedback loop. So that the dopamine neuron promotes through its own release of glutamate, the development of, their, of its own axons. And a data set that is very in line with this observation came a few years later from the Trudeau lab again, uh, when they investigated the uh, uh, VGLU2 conditional knockout mounts. And they observed that dopamine neurons that do not express VGLU2 and therefore no longer have the capacity to also release glutamate um, develop smaller axons and also axons that are less complex. A second data set that was derived from the conditional uh, VGLU2 uh, knockout um, refers to its um, role of the role, the potential role of VGLU2 in strengthening of resilience, because the um, the Steinkelner paper that I mentioned in the introduction uh, performed in, uh, performed experiments in which they uh, exposed uh, wild type mice and VGLU2 conditional knockout mice to uh, 6-HDA and MPTP, and they observed that the lesion within these animals uh, is larger when VGLU2 is not uh, expressed, which is seen here in um, uh, the SN itself, and here in the uh, the, uh, the graph qu uh, that quantified the uh, the cell survival of these dopamine neurons, suggesting that VGLU2 could really contribute to the cell survival. And the last data set that I wanted to show you before I uh, move into my own project is also in line with this potential role of boosting resilience of dopamine neurons, because uh, it has been shown that the expression of VGLU2 can be quite plastic. And again, this is observed in the, in the context of a lesion model, either 6 hj or MPTP. And which means that, first of all, you will observe when, you're, when you expose an animal to, to these toxins, uh, dopaminergic cell loss. But secondly, in the dopamine neurons that uh, are still surviving, we see an upregulation of the number of neurons that now express VGLU2. So this was first uh, shown here by the Trudeau lab. You see here um, that the, the VTA neurons, that only 7% of these neurons express uh, VGLU2. Uh, and after uh, the lesion, this is increased to, to about 26%. And uh, recently, this, was, uh, this observation was confirmed by two other labs um, in, and uh, really strengthening the point that VGLU2 might contribute to this resilience of dopaminergic neurons uh, when exposed to um, uh, a lesion. And this is really the start of my uh, postdoc project. And I really wanted to know what is what are the physiological uh, consequences to this upregulation of VGLU2. Well, to, in order to answer that question, uh, we first decided to create a primary cell culture uh, system in which we treat the cells with a neurotoxin such as MPP, but try to aim for a very low doses as to not um, heal the cells, but to induce a, uh, a molecular change, a, a change in the molecular profile of these neurons. So uh, we created a primary culture of, um, of, of dopamine neurons taken from the dopamine transporter tomato mouse. So all dopamine neurons are uh, red fluorescent. Uh, and after treatment, uh, we were able, we sorted these uh, cultures and we observed um, no cell loss, no specific cell loss uh, after the treatment. So we knew we were using a sublethal dose of MPP+, and we were able to do 
a qPCR on these cells, on these sorted cells, and we observe first uh, a significant loss in TH, uh, which confirms uh, the effect of the treatment. And secondly, we observe this significant upregulation of VQ2 within the same cells. Um, so our next phase, our next experiment was to, to, this, to see if we could determine if this upregulation was a, was a change that could be observed in all dopamine neurons or whether there is a specific subset uh, that is responsible for this upregulation. Um, and to do that, we moved, we repeated a, a large part of this experiment, but we moved into a, a single cell uh, strategy. Um, so we, we created a similar uh, primary dopamine, dopamine culture. Uh, this time we used a THGFP mouse, but it's, in, uh, it's, 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 it's quite the same. Uh, so this time we, uh, and, but this time we didn't sort, but we used a glass pipette to pick up selectively the, the GFP, GFP positive dopamine neurons. And then we were able to do uh, qPCR on those single cells. And we, uh, well, first again, observed a decrease of the TH uh, uh, expression per cell. And we were able to quantify the percentage of dopamine neurons that were still actively uh, trans transcribing, um, uh, expressing TH. And we observed a significant decrease in, in that as well. And secondly, obviously, we uh, looked at the expression of VGLU2. And in this analysis, we decided to do uh, two, two analyses on the same data set. In the first one, we used um, a threshold of 10 copies of VGLU2 to consider a dopamine uh, neuron positive for VGLU2. Uh, so we're using only cells that express 10 copies or more. And in the second data uh, analysis, we used uh, included only the dopamine neurons that expressed um, 20 copies or more of VGLU2. And in both scenarios, uh, we see that uh, VGLU2 is significantly upregulated after the exposure of two uh, micromolar uh, uh, of MPP plus. And um, this is an, uh, an upregulation of uh, twofold, I would say. Next, we, as I said, we were interested in looking whether this is, whether all dopamine neurons have the capacity to upregulate VGLU2 or whether it's only a percentage. And we see here that after treatment, about the majority, about 60% of dopamine neurons are now positive for VGLU2, and that change from control uh, to MPP plus was only significant in the, uh, in the more stringent uh, 20 copy uh, threshold, as you can see right here. Uh, but at least it suggested that the majority uh, of these dopamine neurons are now expressing VGLU2. Um, and here we wondered whether uh, these were dopamine neurons that expressed VGLU2 for the first time at this stage, uh, or whether this was a reactivation of a previous uh, VGLU2 phenotype. And since uh, we had created these cultures using uh, P0 or P1, so just uh, one day old pups, we wondered whether this could potentially be a reactivation of a uh, embryonic uh, phenotype. In order to answer that question, we collaborated with the lab of uh, Professor Avat Ramani uh, at Northwestern University, because he has created this wonderful um, mouse uh, line, uh, an intersectional genetic approach, in which you can visualize um, cells um, using two uh, specific conditional drivers. So in our scenario, in our experiment, this means the, uh, the expression of it a cell requires the expression of both TH and therefore FLIP to remove the first uh, stop codon and the expression of VGLU2 and therefore CRE to remove the second stop codon. And only if a cell expresses both markers or both genes will TD tomato be activated uh, in these cells. So it's a really good way to, to investigate whether a dopamine neuron has a VGLU2 lineage um, at this point. And to show you that this is a selective um, or a specific uh, strategy, uh, these are examples of the control animals that we investigated in which only one of the two drivers is present. So here, vigla 2 cre is absent, but TH flip is positive, but there's no uh, TD tomato expression. And in this one, vigla 2 cre is positive, but um, the uh, TH flip is not pre present. So there is again, no tomato expressed in these dopamine neurons. However, when we investigated the, um, uh, the experimental condition, we observed a lot of uh, TD tomatoes. So using an 
uh, immunohistochemistry, we saw uh, uh, a lot of expression in uh, dopaminergic neurons in the SN and in the VTA. And we quantified these numbers and we see almost 100% of dopamine neurons positive for TD tomato. Um, and since we investigated these mice at birth, so at P1, um, this means that this uh, VK2 expression is indeed, um, uh, must find its origin indeed during the embryonic uh, development uh, of, this, uh, of these mice. And here, um, I would like to take uh, a small side step, side step, side step. Uh, to the, the paper of, uh, of Steinkellner because they had performed a quite similar experiment, uh, not using intersectional uh, genetics, but using uh, a standard vigle 2 cre GFP mouse. But they too had quantified um, these values and had observed that almost 100% of the dopamine neurons um, have a vigle 2 expression history. So these, these data sets are, uh, are confirming one another. So that is always great. So yeah, so uh, as we said, um, uh, we anticipated VK2 expression during embryonic development. So we used in situ hybridization to uh, to test that hypothesis, and um, uh, we we investigated investigated the midbrain at E11.5, so embryonic day 11.5, and this is a um, schematic of that of the midbrain at that age. And here we see the expression of TH and VK2, and we see that their expression uh, pattern are patterns are very much overlapping, suggesting that all the TH-positive dopamine neurons are expressing VGL2 at that same stage. And uh, in addition, when we um, take out, when we took out the, the dopamine neurons or these midbrains, we uh, grew them also in culture. And uh, already one day after uh, we started the, these cultures, we observed uh, VGL2 protein here wonderfully expressed in the growth cone on these dopamine neurons. Uh, we performed in situ hybridization also slightly later, so three days later uh, at embryonic day 14.5. And you can still observe the TH expression and as well the VQ2 expression here in a very medial section of the midbrain. But when um, investigating the more lateral parts of the, the midbrain, uh, we, we, start, we observed that the, the expression of TH and VQ2 by now uh, had become more... Um, mutually exclusive. And um, we propose therefore that the, the uh, repression that we had previously observed to, to be happening uh, in dopamine neurons, uh, the, the repression of VQ2 after birth, we wonder if that might already start happen, starts uh, occurring um, around this age actually embryonically, at least in, in certain parts of the, the midbrain. Um, yes, and here again, uh, it's important to take a sidestep to the paper of uh, the group of Wallen McKenzie, uh, because uh, this, uh, this, in this work, uh, they had performed many different in situ hybridizations, detailing uh, very, very well uh, the midbrain and the expression of several dopaminergic markers, as well as VQ2. And they came to the same conclusion um, that VQ2 is already expressed at uh, E11. Uh, within dopaminergic neurons, overlapping almost completely with dopamine expression. Uh, but they even they, they uh, explain that VQ2 is actually already expressed around E9, E10, and uh, is present before the first dopaminergic um, marker, such as NER1. So uh, using this data set and our own data set, uh, well, we are now quite convinced that uh, VQ2 is expressed in all dopamine neurons this early in development. So uh, we really wanted to understand what could uh, VQ2 be doing this early on in embryonic uh, development. And we decided to do both a loss of function study as well as a, a gain of function study. Um, but to start with the, the loss of function, uh, we first really needed to choose a proper strategy because I had already mentioned that uh, the dopamine, uh, that the that a VQ2 conditional knockout mouse had been um, investigated, uh, and this, this knockout mouse had used the dopamine transporter uh, as uh, as the driver for the um, deletion of VQ2. But we thought that that would not be sufficient for us because if I show you again uh, data from this time, it's taken from the Allen Brain Atlas. But if you look at the expression of VQ2 here at embryonic day 11, it's present, it's TH is present, but the dopamine transporter is not yet expressed at that age. Um, in fact, it will be expressed around uh, day 13, day 14. 
Um, so it would not serve the purpose of the, the research question that we had. Uh, so for this reason, we, uh, we contacted the lab of Professor Rosemund in uh, Berlin and uh, to, to investigate the uh, constitutive VGL2 knockout. This mouse has its own problems um, because these, um, these mice, these knockouts, they die uh, shortly after birth. Uh, so in, in the end, we decided to investigate the, the latest time point possible, which was uh, embryonic day E18.5, which is one day before, um, uh, before birth. Um, yes, and we started by using uh, immunohistochemistry to investigate the, the dopamine system. And uh, here, this is uh, the images of the SN, so the roster part of the midbrain moving uh, more broadly to the VTA. Um, and uh, we observed uh, when we investigated the sort of the pros anatomy of the midbrain, uh, no changes between the, the VGL2 wild type and uh, the knockout at E18.5. Uh, and we quantified the number of dopamine neurons that were present here. And also, uh, we did not observe any changes between the, the, these numbers. Um, so we can only conclude here that um, uh, VGL2 uh, might be very early expressed in dopamine neurons, but it does not, it's not required for uh, the dopaminergic survival during normal embryonic development. And um, um, yes, yeah, so we, we next investigated the um, uh, expression region, or the, sorry, the projection region of, uh, dop of the dopamine neurons. So using in, in, in immunohistochemistry, uh, which means obviously the striatum in this scenario. So, uh, and also here we, we uh, compared uh, wild type animals with uh, uh, knockout animals and we hardly observed any changes. It seems to, uh, the development seems to go very well, even without VGL2. The only change we observed was here in the very caudal part, dorsal part of the, um, the VGL2 knockout, where we saw uh, a significant decrease of TH immunoreactivity um, in the knockout animals. And um, we think that um, if you remember the image that I showed you in the introduction, where we saw the different subsets of uh, uh, neurons present in the in the substantia nigra and in the midbrain, those VGL2 uh, positive neurons in the in the SN, the, the bright yellow ones that are expressed, um, that are located very much in the lateral tip of the SN, uh, they are known to project to, uh, at least in the adult brain, to the dorsal and caudal tail of the of the striatum. So we wonder whether potentially this is the subset that is affected um, by um, the loss of VGL2 this early on during embryonic development. And to just confirm um, that this is really a loss of TH uh, immunoreactivity and not a loss of actual axons or projections, we performed another immunohistochemistry using uh, VMAT2 um, to verify, actually, if, if VMAT2 would show a similar uh, phenotype, but uh, uh, this is not the case. Uh, again, suggesting that this is really an effect of, v of TH expression or a loss of TH expression in the absence of VGL2. Um, right, so the next uh, step of, our, of the project was to use uh, an overexpression model uh, to investigate the role of VGL2. And, um, we chose to use a lentiviral approach um, for control. Uh, we used the overexpression of, of a venous uh, vector, which you can see here in, uh, in GFP. And uh, for our experimental condition, we chose a VGL2 venous uh, lentiviral virus, uh, which is a, um, a fusion uh, protein, actually. So you, here you can observe the GFP, and I'm hoping you can see also the, the VGL2 that, uh, that is overexpressed in these cells as well. And um, it's important actually for you to realize that in culture, uh, using a lentivirus, uh, dopamine neurons are actually not that easy to uh, infect, um, which is usually a big problem or a very disappointing uh, strategy. Uh, however, at this time, it really worked in our favor because we really didn't want to increase a lot uh, the level of uh, uh, VGL2 uh, overexpression because, well, for, for two reasons. First, um, increasing high levels or creating high levels of VGL2 could potentially lead to high levels of glutamate release, which can be very neurotoxic uh, for the dopamine neurons. 
And secondly, we really wanted to uh, investigate um, the sort of physiological uh, upregulation that we observed using a, uh, the MPP plus treatment that we did in our single cell experiment. And the upregulation that we observed here was only about uh, twofold. Um, so we didn't want to go higher than this. And what we, when we quantified our VGLU2 immunoreactivity, um, we observed indeed uh, only a 50% increase of um, VGLU2. So we're very pleased with that. It's, it's within the range that we were hoping for. And um, yeah, so uh, I had I'd mentioned that uh, we had previously seen that uh, uh, VGLU2, dop uh, sorry, dopamine neurons in the absence of VGLU2 uh, develop smaller and less complex axons. So obviously we were interested to see if the reverse would create um, the opposite effect indeed. So in order to answer that question, we uh, well, these are examples of a control uh, dopamine neuron and uh, a neuron overexpressing VGLU2 and Venus. And we traced uh, these neurons, uh, making a distinction between the axon here in green and uh, the dendrite here in yellow using uh, MAP2. And we quantified uh, the complexity using a show analysis and we just we traced the length of the axon and dendrite as well. Um, and indeed, uh, with moderate overexpression of VGLU2, we see the uh, upregulation here of the axon length. Uh, and we see also an increase of the number of branches uh, in these dopamine neurons. And we see uh, an increase of the intersections, suggesting that these, uh, these axons have become uh, slightly more complex um, now that there is slightly more VGLU2 present in these dopamine neurons. Suggesting again that VGLU2 uh, promotes the axonal growth in dopamine neurons, at least in vitro. Yes, and here it's important to take yet another side step because um, the overexpression uh, or at least different overexpression strategies were also um, um, undertaken by the Steinkellner paper and by the Shen paper. Uh, both different papers used um, an AEV approach, so an AEV virus, which is quite different from a lenti, and also um, they used different viruses from one another, and both in infected uh, live uh, animals, which on honestly is always more difficult to, uh, to interpret. Um, but um, the, the both papers re uh, result there. Sorry, the experiments of both papers resulted in very different data sets. So the overexpression of VGLU2 in the Steinkellner paper resulted in massive dopaminergic cell loss, while uh, the Shen paper displayed actually enhanced dopamine survival in the context of a lesion. And um, yeah, these these, these uh, contrasting data sets are quite difficult to interpret. Uh, except potentially for the fact that uh, if there is a difference in the level of VGLU2 that is induced by these different viruses, uh, there could therefore also be a different level of neurotoxicity, at least in the high levels, in the, in the experiment in which high levels of VGLU2 have been induced. And uh, I think it's even last week when a follow-up study was uh, at least submitted to BioArchive, um, in which these two viruses have been compared to one another. And indeed, they are able to now uh, uh, associate higher levels of VGLU2 overexpression to neurotoxicity and lower levels of VGLU2 upregulation to um, cell survival or enhanced resilience, at least, in dopamine neurons. So, um, yeah, I think these combined these data sets really, data sets really go, uh, show how sensitive and um, uh, this, this balance is of VGLU2 expression and that uh, too little is not a good effect on dopamine neurons, but too much uh, isn't either. Right, so just a small summary before we, we tackle the last data set. Um, in absence of dopamine, of VGLU2, dopamine neurons grow smaller axons. After a lesion, we see a slight upregulation of VGLU2 and uh, overexpression of VGLU2, slight or moderate overexpression at least, uh, results in uh, an increase of the axonal growth. So when we looked at all these data together, uh, we were wondering whether it's possible that the enhanced VGLU2 expression that is observed in the post-lesional brain could potentially uh, reactivate the glutamatergic autocrine feedback loop that is present here, and by doing that, stimulate the axon to 
create uh, compass and tori sprouting or to re innervate the striatum after uh, a lesion. And uh, to test that research question, um, we created the following uh, experimental approach. Um, we used, we created a uh, partial lesion uh, in the dorsal part of the striatum using 6 HDA in both the VGLU2 wild type uh, animals and in VGLU2 conditional knockouts. Um, after that, we let the animal recover for six weeks uh, because it has been shown in literature that spontaneous uh, re-innovation of the striatum can occur uh, at, this, at this time point after a lesion. And we used, um, at this time, we injected retro reeds, in this case, red fluorescent retro reeds, uh, and injected them exactly within the lesion or the same coordinates that we had used for the 6 HDA lesion. And these retro reeds can be taken up by uh, the terminals that are present there and will then be transported back into uh, the cell body of these cells. So this gave us a way to quantify the number of terminals present six weeks after the lesion by doing an immunohistochemistry on the midbrain itself and, and uh, visualizing these retrobeats within the dopamine neurons. And here we hypothesized that we would be able to see uh, compensatory sprouting in the wild type animals. So we would be able to see quite some retrobeats present in dopamine neurons, but we thought that in the VGLU2 conditional knockout, where this um, uh, compensatory VGLU2 upregulation uh, could not occur, we would see uh, a more, uh, a less successful innervation of the striatum. And here, this is the, um, uh, the data set, well, examples of the immunohistochemistry data set that we were able to obtain from these experiments. And I hope that you can acknowledge that the retro reads are, that they co-localize very well within the, the midbrain and within the dopaminergic uh, neurons. So we were able to, to count and quantify these retro reads quite well. And indeed, we, well, we first we saw uh, a treatment effect and we saw a specific downregulation of the number of retro reads uh, within the lesioned animals in the VGLU2 conditional knockouts uh, compared to their uh, controls. And while um, we did not observe a larger lesion, uh, like uh, had been observed in the VGLU2 conditional knockout in the Steinkelner paper, we did observe a significant uh, decrease of TH immunoreactivity within the dorsal uh, part of the striatum, within the lesion. And together, uh, yeah, grouping this data together, we uh, uh, concluded that um, we see a, a perturbed striatal innervation specifically in the VGLU2 conditional knockout six weeks after a lesion. So um, conclu the conclusions of, uh, of the work that I presented to you today, um, we see that uh, we propose that VGLU2 is present uh, and expressed in the most dopamine neurons uh, during embryo, uh, embryogenesis or embryonic development. And that this is downregulated um, uh, during maturation. Uh, a subset of these dopamine neurons have the capacity to reactivate this VGLU2 expression when challenged with uh, a lesion, for example, and this upregulation uh, can contribute to the re-innovation of the striatum uh, when this occurs. And um, yeah, so uh, just the last uh, point that I wanted to, to make uh, uh, before I, I thank my collaborators is um, a, an important question that we have not answered in this work is exactly which dopaminergic neurons, which subset of dopamine neurons has the capacity to upregulate VGLU2. Um, and I'm hoping that in the future, we will be able to answer that question. For example, using the interse intersectional genetics, that um, the tool that was uh, among others developed by Professor Awad um, And potentially we could create a map as is created here for the um, adult and healthy brain, uh, we might be able to create a similar one uh, for a um, pathological or post-lesional brain, knowing exactly how uh, the brain adapts in terms of, um, uh, of pathology or, or, or lesions. Yes, and with that, I would like to um, uh, thank my, uh, the, the lab members in the, the Trudeau lab and the collaborators uh, in the different labs uh, uh, here uh, noted here on the slide, uh, and also uh, our funding agency that supported this work, uh, the CIHR. And uh, thank you for uh, your attention.
Great, thanks, fantastic talk. So there's a question um, in the chat. Uh, it says, um, it's from Genevieve. She says, um, if you have control without vglut2 to test if it's neurotoxic. So- um, so, Sorry, I, I didn't hear, I didn't hear it. Um, so she says, do you have control uh, control without vglut2 to test if it's neurotoxic? I think she means perhaps the MPP experiment. Um, so did you do, were, were you able to do this? I was kind of wondering the same thing. If you were able to um, do the MPP lesion, but somehow prevent the upregulation of vglut2 and see if that uh, okay. is going to uh, change the toxicity level. Right. So I think so in the, the primary culture, we did indeed uh, do, uh, uh, we grew different, similar cultures with and without uh, the MPP plus and sorted and did not see the change. Um, however, uh, I think one way to test that, which we didn't do, but it's actually interesting, we'll just use a, a VQ2 conditional knockout, I would say, and do the same treatment. Mm -hmm. And then if you, then you would, uh, well, clearly can, you can prevent the um, upregulation of VGLU2, then mm -hmm. you wouldn't see that change. Um, and then at least perhaps you could see if the TH uh, change are related to that. I wouldn't expect that, but that could be the case. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Cool. Okay, there's another question. Um, can you speculate on why dopamine neurons in the VTA, many of them still express vglut2 in adult animals so right so i think that um so we know that the level of vglut2 expression in the adult animal is still very low right it's only the um uh, about 10 copies and i think that it's actually those dopamine neurons that have those 10 copies that still have the capacity to uh, increase their, their expression levels when confronted with a lesion or stress or potentially confronted with a situation in which they have to expand uh, slightly their axonal branching. Mm -hmm. But the dopamine neurons that are expressing, uh, I, I hypothesize that dopamine neurons that express levels of equal to below that or basically none at all, um, it might be too difficult for them to reactivate that phenotype. Mm -hmm. Just gonna stop sharing here. And then I had one more question. Um, would uh, so you you said that you get about a twofold increase in the vglut2 with the um, with the MPP expression? Does that is that in the tier that would promote survival, or is it above and in the tier that promotes degeneration? Um, that's a very good question. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, since we, uh, we, but we did the, um, in the effect sorting experiment, we did not observe um, uh, cell loss, right? We had, it was, uh, this, the, the, on average, the numbers were the same. And this was a treatment um, when the dopamine, when it was already a quite stable culture. Uh, and it was a two day, two day, we sorted two days after the treatment. Mm -hmm. So, if the, the upregulation uh, must have, uh, was, would have been neurotoxic, I would have ex expected it to have been noticeable on our uh, fact sort experiment. Um, but what would still be interesting, something that I haven't seen either in the other papers that have been present, is to sort of uh, align these upregulations, these very moderate upregulations, which we could do also with, glut with quantifying the actual release of glutamate to see if this is also. Um, occurs in, in small increments or whether after 60 copies, it's just uh, uh, blown completely out of proportion, for, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Um, 